Hi. So I strongly believe that in 2022, you can learn anything you want to, as long as you have stable internet and a computer, all the resources are online. So in this video, I want to give you a few resources if you're interested in learning computational neuroscience. So I myself studied computational neuroscience at the Donders Institute during my master's degree. And before that, I did my bachelor's in theoretical physics. So I think in general, it doesn't really matter what you did your bachelor's or undergrad in, as long as it's a STEM field subject. But if you want to go on to do a master or a PhD in computational neuroscience, there are some skills that you need beforehand that I will discuss in this video. So I went through everything that I learned in my bachelor's and in my master's that I now need in my PhD in computational neuroscience, such that you may follow this same path, but way accelerated and without some expensive university you have to go to. So in computational neuroscience, there are three skills you really need to develop, and that's programming, mathematics, and neuroscience, of course. So I will first delve a little bit into programming. So in general, it's assumed before you start your master's even, but also in your PhD that you know some programming. So if in your undergraduate you haven't learned any type of programming, it is good to kind of start learning it. And even if you don't have an undergraduate, it's good to start learning programming as soon as you can. So in neuroscience, the most popular languages right now are Python and R. And if you have to choose one of them, I would choose Python probably to begin with, because from what I've heard, most people find Python the most intuitive at the beginning. And in general, Python has the biggest community online. So if you have any questions or any doubts, usually you can find some people online that can answer your questions for any type of programming question. But also some other languages are still used and that's C++, MATLAB and Yulia. And C++ is usually used for a little bit some older code, but some of my professors also still only work in C++, so it's good if you know a little bit. And then MATLAB is now slowly becoming out of trend, but especially in physics where I worked, it was really popular. And Yulia is a new language that is super fast. It's, I think, one of the fastest languages at the moment. So I think in the future it will be a language that will be heavily used. But let's first start with Python. So if you want to learn Python, I think one of the best resources that I have ever used is 100 Days of Code. It's this course by Angela Yu and it's online, I'll put it here. But it's amazing because from most programming courses, you don't start to immediately program. So they just teach you the theoretical notions and all the things aside of this. But with the 100 Days of Code program, you immediately start start programming. And I think this is one of the biggest things you need to learn during programming is that you need to start from the beginning, building your own games, your own data analysis programs, your own projects. And in this course, Angela, you really takes you from the beginning, very beginning programming to pretty advanced topics actually. So even I, I did it, I think two years ago, I learned some new skills that I didn't have before. Then in general, I would also, if you're gonna use Python or R, I would set up Jupyter Notebooks. So Jupyter Notebooks are these kind of notebooks that look like this. And I think for programmers, this is not super commonly used. I'm not too sure. But in science, this is a really nice way to write your code because in between you can put your little queries or your questions or theoretical notions that you have. So if you write your code like this, it's almost written like a paper, which then in the end you can publish. So I would also learn how to use Jupyter Notebook. Then the next skill you need to learn in programming is machine learning. And machine learning in general is just a really broad topic of all different kind of algorithms you can use with big data, but also small data sets. And the book that I really like and still have actually, let me show you, is this one. So it's Pattern Recognition and Machine Learning by Christopher Bishop. And I actually sold all my books from my master's and also my bachelor's. But this one I kept because it's just super good. And even now I still use it sometimes ever as a reference. But I think it is maybe a little bit hard for beginners to understand. So there's also this course I heard, which is pretty good. So it's on course around machine learning. It's just called Machine Learning by Andrew and I'll put it up here. And I think in general, I heard it's pretty nice, but I did my machine learning courses at university, so I'm not too sure. 
And another book that's quite commonly used is Information Theory, Inference and Learning Algorithms by David McKay. And I've read some of the chapters from his book, but because I have the Bishop book, I didn't really feel the need to read it fully, but it is quite good as well. I think these two are pretty comparable. So just choose one of them basically. And then for the final few little skills, I would also learn some Unix code if you're at it. Um, so this is just how to use the terminal because with computational neuroscience you're using a lot of really big data sets so to, to move them from one folder to another for example or to compile a few data sets into one big file this is most easily done with the terminal and it's just kind of nice if you know some of the basic commands that you have to use and then also I would start from the beginning. I wish someone told me this when I started during my bachelor, but to use GitHub. So GitHub is just this place where you put all your code and it's in general used for version control. But I also really like it as kind of a library of all the code I've ever written. So I didn't start using it until after my master and I really regret this because I made some pretty cool projects during my master. But now I use GitHub and it's just really nice to see some of the code that I've written last year. So yeah, then the next big skill you need is mathematics and mathematics kind of is this broader term for also data science, statistics, and even a little bit of physics, I think is nice if you can learn that. Mathematics is kind of a big bottleneck for a lot of students that I've seen. So one of the skills you first need to develop is just linear algebra. From what I've heard, the introduction to linear algebra by Gilbert Strang is pretty good. And he also has some courses online. So some of my friends that haven't studied linear algebra are now using his courses and they say it's pretty nice. And also I would just in general use YouTube. So I really like this channel, three blue, one brown. And it's just a really cute channel that explains all the different type of linear algebra uh, things there are, but also other types of mathematics. And even though it seems really simple how they explain it, the topics they explain are actually pretty complex in their course. So they did a really good job of explaining super difficult topics in an easy manner. Then the next skill you need is data science and statistics. And I think for a lot of people, this is the most boring skill, but it's actually during your PhD, one of the skills you will most heavily rely on. Because even though you're studying neuroscience, what you have in the end are just big data sets. And to make any type of conclusions or any type of statement, you need statistics to kind of make the foundation for that statement. So there are a few courses that I liked. Um, so fundamentals of statistics is one probability the science of uncertainty and data is another and i also really like this book naked statistics which is kind of more an intuitive way of explaining some of the more difficult topics in statistics and i think reading that first and then taking a good course on statistics is really nice way to go and also if you haven't learned r at this point yet this is a good point to start applying the r language a little bit because all the tutorials in R are written specifically for using statistics. So I think it's one of the best languages to learn statistics with. And lastly, within mathematics, I think it's also nice to get a little bit an overview of some of the concepts used in physics, because a lot of people that are now doing computational neuroscience are trained physicists. So they will use some of the models that are also used in physics. And one of the biggest areas that you kind of need to know is electro magnetism and this is because the brain in general is an electrical machine right so for example single cell recordings that the models that we use for those are very similar to the models that are used in physics I don't really have a specific book that I super like but the introduction to electromagnetism is the one we used and is the one that's most used in undergraduate courses but I assume that there are probably better resources out there because this is a pretty dense book, but you can start there if you want to. And then another topic from physics that I would personally dive into a little bit is quantum physics. And that's because quantum computing is up and coming. And also there's a theory of the quantum brain, which I don't really agree with, but I do think it's a super interesting theory. And one of my professors at the University of Nijmegen is working in this field, Bert van Kappen, and he wrote this paper that I think is really good. It's called an anatomic Boltzmann machine capable of self-adaptation. So I think that's a good place to start. And also he gave some lectures, which I will put here. So in general, quantum physics is still new how it's being used in computing, but also in neuroscience. But it's just such a fun field to dive into. 
And especially if you're thinking of doing a PhD in computational neuroscience, I think this is a good field to kind of get a little bit of flavor of what's possible in the future. Okay, and then the last topic is actually neuroscience. And you're probably wondering, is computational neuroscience, why save this to the last? And that's because I think neuroscience is one of the broadest topics that you will have to learn about. But the problem or the difficulty with neuroscience is because it's so broad, it's kind of easy to get lost in super specific topics that actually in maybe the field you want to go to are not really applied anymore. And I also think neuroscience in general is the easiest skill you have to learn. And that's mostly that there's not that much prerequisite knowledge that you really need to have, except maybe a little bit the anatomy of the brain, but even that you can learn during your PhD pretty fast. So what you will need to learn in neuroscience depends a lot on the field you want to go to in the end. So for example, if you want to go to genetics and the brain, so the correlation between our genes and certain brain functions, it's good to learn a lot about genetics. But if you want to do a little bit more of what I do, for example, which is the link between psychiatric disorders and certain brain functions, it's also good to follow maybe a psychology course on psychiatry. So you can already see it's quite hard to decide what topics to learn in neuroscience. But what I would recommend if I started over is not to take one course in computational neuroscience or in neuroscience. I would actually follow the papers that are the biggest right now in the field and read the articles that have been published in the last five years or so. So some of the papers that I really like are Nature Reviews Neuroscience and Nature Neuroscience. So Nature in general is one of the biggest journals in STEM field sciences and always has really good overview papers of important findings in the last year. So some fun papers that have been published recently are deep learning in alternate reality and neurons as will and representation. So if you just go to their website, some of the papers are public, but for some you, you do need to pay some fee, but I think there's a discount for students. Or if you're at a university, usually they are public in university spheres. And another paper I really like is eLife. This is an open journal which means that anyone can access it. That to me is really important because some of us don't have the funds to pay for these super expensive paper journal subscriptions. So in eLife, a friend of mine recently published and I really like her paper. So I want to brag a little bit about this. So it's charting brain growth and aging at high spatial precision, which is really nice. Um, and there are a few other papers that are really nice on there. And, and this is among others, right? There are other journals that are really good. You also have Neuron and a few others I'll list here. So I think it's just a really good skill to learn how to read papers, get the most important topics, and then see when you have questions or if you find a topic really interesting, to then take a little lecture on it or a course or find a professor that can explain a little bit about it. And another little tip that I would do is to follow your favorite researchers on Twitter because every time they publish something, they publish it also usually on Twitter. And then you just have your automatic curated newsfeed every morning of the most important updates for you in the field. So yeah, these were the resources and the skills that I would recommend if I would start over learning my neuroscience, computational neuroscience degree. But if you found that some skills are missing, I would love to hear them or if you have some resources that I didn't mention because I still have students coming and I would always love to recommend them the latest best resources and otherwise see you next time. Bye!